The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, an extended conversation with Robert Kuttner about his new book, The Stakes, 2020 and the Survival of American Democracy. And Bill Press talks with David Farenthold of The Washington Post about President Trump's history of profiting off his presidency. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. In his latest book, Robert Kuttner makes the case that Donald Trump has brought American democracy perilously close to the brink and that it will only get worse if he wins a second term. He argues for a revival of New Deal era populism to bring us back from the edge and begin to repair the damage. And we say hello to Robert Kuttner, most recently the author of The Stakes, 2020 and the Survival of American Democracy, and the co-founder and co-editor of The American Prospect. He's also the author of 12 books on the interplay of politics and economics and holds the Ida and Meyer Kirsten Chair at Brandeis University. Bob Kuttner, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Well, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate the chance to talk to your listeners. Well, certainly our pleasure. You know, as the title of this new book makes clear, this next election is about nothing less than the survival of democracy. How has Donald Trump been able to erode what we often call the guardrails of democracy? You know, uh, we always say that the next election is the most important in history, blah, blah, blah. This one really is, because I think if you look at what Trump has done in his first two and a half years, if you give him four more years, we will be like one of those countries that has the forms of democracy, but no substance. So, I mean, for starters, and this is stating the obvious, uh, Trump has tried to govern by decree. He has complete contempt for the rule of law. He tries to govern like a dictator. And happily, enough of American democracy has managed to survive that he has been stymied at least some of the time. Why was American democracy weakened? I think for several different reasons. One, I think there are some trends that have nothing to do with politics per se that weaken democracy. Uh, Television, followed by uh, social media, crowded out real civic activity. That's one problem. Secondly, I think uh, presidents of both parties expanded executive power, uh, getting Congress to pass uh, laws, giving them emergency powers that were just waiting to be abused by Donald Trump. And why did that happen? Well, first of all, you had World War II as a wartime emergency. Then you had the Cold War expanding, expanding the powers of executives, uh, expanding the power of government to spy on Americans. Uh, that was uh, intensified by 9-11 and the Patriot Act. So we have a, a very strong executive of the sort that uh, alarmed the founding fathers that was waiting for a president to to really abuse it. Um, W had abused it to some extent. Obama pulled back a little bit and then Trump doubled down on all the opportunities uh, for abuse. But then you have a whole other strand of purely partisan abuse, beginning with Gingrich. I mean, Newt Gingrich, when he was speaker in the 1990s, decided that he was just going to do everything he possibly could to make it impossible for uh, Bill Clinton to accomplish anything. And then uh, Mitch McConnell, when he became Senate Majority Leader, doubled down on Gingrich's playbook. So the, the Republicans, I think, have been very contemptuous of democracy. And the, the, the really sad thing is that even though going into the 2016 election, almost the entire Republican Party felt that Trump was dangerous, felt that he was unsuitable to be president once he got elected. Uh, Republicans in Congress who did not like Trump very much, who were wary of Trump, 
were very happy to become his enablers and and he became their enablers and so you have the really appalling spectacle of one of america's two parties being willing to give up democracy in order to get the substantive policies and ideologies that that it wants so that's where we are with american democracy the good news here is that if you look at the 2018 midterm where uh, democrats in the house flipped 43 seats that had been held by republicans many of them deep in trump country uh, that shows you that enough of democracy is still alive and well i have a chapter in my book the stakes called suppression meets mobilization uh, despite gerrymandering, despite all kinds of techniques of voter suppression, ranging from closing polling places to extreme gerrymandering to purges of voter rolls, all for partisan or racist purposes, the Democrats could still flip uh, 43 seats. And so uh, despite the Russians, despite all the nasty stuff Trump does, uh, if Democrats can be mobilized, then I think uh, we we can not only win in 2020, but we can win decisively. Well, and as you point out, of course, many things happened before Trump was elected that paved the way politically. But as you also make it clear, that has a great deal to do with economics. So what's the economic story we need to understand if we're to understand how we got to Donald Trump's election? Yes, and that's that's the other really important, maybe even more important part of the book. My basic point is that for 40 years, both parties, the Republicans worse than the Democrats, but the Democrats badly enough so that their credibility was impaired. Both parties uh, ignored the plight of ordinary working families at a time when the world, when the rules of the economy were being turned against uh, regular working people. And it's no accident that in the 30 years after World War II, when the economy was really delivering for ordinary working people, you know, there was no appeal uh, for ultra-nationalists or neo-fascists, and there was uh, a lot of confidence in government, and that's because government was delivering. It's, it's not accidental that in country after country, the far right has made gains at a time when the economy stopped delivering for regular people. Now, why did it stop delivering? It has nothing to do with technology. It has nothing to do with globalization. It has everything to do with the rules being rigged on behalf of bankers and uh, uh, Wall Street uh, hedge funds and private equity companies and all the good people who brought us uh, the collapse of 2008. And unfortunately, as a, as a lifelong Democrat, it really pains me to say this. But the Democrats, particularly the presidential wing of the party, uh, Bill Clinton being the worst defender, the Democrats were enablers of this as much as the Republicans. And, and uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016 really paid the price of Bill Clinton's sins uh, in, in more ways than one. So that when, when Hillary Clinton in 2016 is uh, wearing identity on her sleeve while she is taking $500,000 speaking fees from Wall Street, voters in the heartland just throw up their hands or maybe they just throw up and they say, Let, let's just get somebody else in here who, who promises to blow it all up. It could hardly be worse. Maybe, maybe this crazy guy will make it better. And I think the, the pent-up economic frustrations, look at life from the point of view of a 30-year-old uh, trying to get a foot in the middle class. Housing is unaffordable. Regular payroll jobs are turning into gig jobs. You're, you're either without employer-provided health insurance, or if you have it, you're locked into a job that maybe you don't like. Uh, if you want to get a college degree, you are risking having a lifetime of debt. And the economy really is lousy for ordinary people, has been getting lousier for 20 or 30 years. And I think the opening for Democrats this time is that even though Trump talked a good game, and even though the economy is not too bad on average, none of those fundamentals have changed for ordinary people. Housing is still unaffordable. Uh, too much of the economic growth is concentrated in a handful of metro areas. Uh, reliable payroll jobs are getting more scarce, not more plentiful. Uh, wages are basically static. Uh, Employer-provided health insurance is getting harder to come by. Pensions are getting harder to come by, um, et cetera. So I think uh, Democrats, with a kind of Roosevelt-style appeal to regular people, 
could win big. And, and I think the other really important reason to lead with progressive economics is that Democrats are at risk of being divided along the lines of race and ethnicity. The one thing that unites working people of all races is the feeling that the economy is not delivering for them. So if you lead with the economy, you stand a much better chance of, of bridging over these potentially disabling schisms of race. We're speaking with Bob Kuttner, author of The Stakes, 2020 and the Survival of American Democracy. Bob, something else that you describe are some of the cultural shifts, and you started to touch on this in the beginning, that are, but the cultural shifts that are weakening civic engagement and how they erode democracy. So what are some of the most significant shifts? Well, I look at, I look at my parents' generation uh, and to some extent my generation you know, there was a time when um, Americans uh, did not watch so much television, did not get so hooked on social media, and people had more time to participate in the humble activities of basic democracy, going to uh, zoning commission hearings, uh, participating in the local PTA, all of the things that Alexis de Tocqueville when he visited the United States in the 1830s, celebrated about the United States. People were not just uh, committed to democracy in the sense of voting once every two years or voting once every four years, but they really participated. There's a sociologist at Harvard named Theda Scotchpole who did uh, some, some renowned uh, research showing that 100 years ago, there were 53 national organizations that had dues-paying members, more than a million members each, people who went to meetings and elected delegates to state uh, organizations who in turn elected delegates to national organizations. These were schoolhouses for democracy. They're all gone. I mean, if, if you look at what passes for um, organizations today, with a handful of exceptions, they're letterhead organizations that are basically run by Washington staff and you become a, quote, member by, by, by sending in a check. Now, one exception to this on the liberal side is the labor movement, where people still go to meetings and people still, you know, uh, really participate. Uh, on the political right, uh, an exception is the NRA. But for the most part, uh, that sort of civic activity is much, much weaker. And I think uh, a strong democracy is not just built on, on elections every few years, but it's built on day in and day out civic engagement. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We're talking with Robert Kuttner, author of The Stakes, 2020 and the Survival of American Democracy. Coming up next, pocketbook populism and the path to American renewal as we continue our conversation with Robert Kuttner. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. 
When did we the people vote to outlaw peaceful public protest against corporate profiteers who are running roughshod over our values, livelihoods, environment, and, well, our lives? Answer, never. Yet behind our backs, for sale state lawmakers are passing corporate written laws that criminalize our protests against their greed, assessing inordinate jail time and exorbitant fines for the vague offense of interrupting or interfering with corporate operations and infrastructure. Last year, the Secretive American Legislative Exchange Council, a corporate finance front group, wrote a model bill called the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act to sledgehammer peaceful protesters of corporate wrongdoing. Virtually identical versions of Alec's bill were then introduced in 22 state legislatures, and nine have already been enacted in Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Missouri, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, and Texas. The Texas version, which took effect September 1, was used just 11 days later to slap harsh felony charges on the Greenpeace protesters and 20 others who were also arrested during the nonviolent symbolic shutdown of the Houston Ship Channel. It was lobbied through the legislature by Chevron, Dow, Exxon, Coke Industries, Shell, and other giants. Then it was signed by Governor Greg Abbott, whose top industrial donor group is, surprise, Oil and gas, which pumped more than $10 million into his 2018 election campaign. This is Jim Hightower saying these autocrats say they just want to stop violence and vandalism. But Greenpeace protesters committed neither. The real intent of these laws is to penalize legitimate protest. To help fight this blatant suppression, go to Polluter Watch at polluterwatch.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We're talking with Robert Kuttner, author of The Stakes 2020 and the Survival of American Democracy. Bob, we've gone over some of the bad news in the first part of this conversation, but this is also a book about hope. You argue that we can regain what we've lost under Donald Trump, but only if Democrats pursue an all-out progressive economic agenda. You call it pocketbook populism. How do you define populist populism? I think you stand up for regular people and you stand up against Wall Street. And Trump did a variety of head fakes, uh, kind of signaling that he would be that kind of leader. And of course, he personifies the swamp that he promised to drain. So if uh, a candidate like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders could get the nomination, uh, I think uh, there's a huge pent up desire for, for that sort of uh, Democrat. We did not get that uh, under under most recent uh, Democratic uh, nominees and even most recent Democratic presidents. So there are things that you could do that are very popular politically, uh, like a $15 minimum wage, uh, like a massive infrastructure program to rebuild the economy along green lines and along the way, take back a lot of jobs, a lot of technologies, that America needs to be leaders in, uh, often technologies that that China is making off with. And um, those policies are popular. I think substantial relief of student debt would be enormously popular. I've I've called for a bill of rights for the young, where you make it possible once again to afford a starter home and to go to college without being uh, saddled with debt. Uh, You know, (laughs) far from being a radical idea, Tuition-free public higher education was normal in America for more than 100 years. It was invented under Lincoln when we had the great so-called land-grant universities, the great public universities. It was only in the 80s and 90s when Republicans started uh, cutting taxes at the state level and state legislatures responded by increasing tuition in public universities that had once been free that, that students got saddled with debt. So these are not far out things. These are very popular things. 
And that's what I mean by pocketbook populism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned the college, you know, college, as you say, college became a business in, in the 80s. And and it's only getting worse. And it's and, and the thing about that, too, is that all these people that are coming up now, they don't know anything else. And so now you have to convince well, they, them that, you know, that that it's it doesn't have to be this way. That's the point. That's it doesn't have to be this way. And it's so easy to blame technology. It, it's so easy to blame everything but the fact that the people who are in charge have rigged the rules in favor of Wall Street against ordinary working people. I mean, that was the case in the 1920s. And Roosevelt came along and with a lot of popular support, changed the rules. The rules don't have to be the rules that we have. And Trump managed to squeak into office because he pretended that he would change the rules on behalf of ordinary people, but he's really worsened the rules so that his own cronies can make off with even more money. Mm -hmm. Now, Bob, this is also about how Democrats tell the story. So what's the narrative progressive Democrats should be offering American voters? Well, I think Elizabeth Warren does this really well. I mean, you know, people say, oh, she's a college professor. But, of course, Warren is a working class kid from Oklahoma who, who made it the hard way. And she is particularly good at relating the policy changes that we need to the lived life of ordinary people, where uh, it takes two incomes to put bread on the table where you don't have affordable uh, child care, where you're a couple of paychecks away from bankruptcy. And a good politician is a good storyteller. And I think Warren is very good in particular at, at connecting real stories to the policy changes and the political changes that we need. You know, uh, some people uh, think that Warren and uh, Sanders are gaining on Biden because they're just better on their feet and Biden is maybe past his pull date, I think that's only partly true. I think Warren and Sanders are gaining on Biden because they have a much, much more compelling story to tell. And, and when Biden says, you know, Trump was a kind of an anomaly and all we need to do is, uh, is bring the country back to normal, normal isn't good enough. Normal is what gave us Donald Trump. We need a very different kind of normal. God forbid if normal is what brought us Donald Trump. You know, I mean, when I think about that, I just think, oh, my goodness. Um, what convinces well, it's the, you, it's though? The, it, it, it's, it's the economic normal. Let me be precise. Yeah. It's the economic normal of regular working people getting the short end of the stick and finally deciding that enough was enough and that the Democrats didn't speak for them. That sense of normal is what brought us Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Now, what convinces you, though, that there are enough Americans that are ready to support a progressive agenda that we can vote Trump out of the White House? I mean, you, you hear these conversations about electability, and they sort of seem to suggest a more centrist candidate is the better route. Yeah, I, I think if you look at uh, where Trump won the election and the defection of white working class voters in the Midwest— there is a lot more pay dirt for Democrats uh, if we can win back some of those voters than there is in appealing to suburban moderates. I think a lot of suburban moderates, Republicans, are so disgusted with Trump that they're going to vote for the Democrat no matter who the Democrat is. It, it, it's hard to imagine uh, a suburban moderate who's just appalled by Trump's disgusting behavior saying that, well, Elizabeth Warren's a Democratic nominee, but you know, I'm not sure if I'm for a minimum wage or I'm not sure if I'm for college debt relief. I, 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 I think I'm going to vote for Trump. I, I think a lot of suburban moderates who may have voted for Trump last time, I find it very hard to believe that they're going to do it again. Whereas I think there are so many more uh, working class voters in those Midwestern states where the election swung to Trump who can be won back to the Democrats. They used to be the heart and soul of the Democratic Party. And with, with the right kind of nominee, the right kind of program, uh, there are many, many more of those than there are uh, suburban swing voters who were at risk of voting for Trump again. The other thing, Donald Trump and many members of the GOP have made it clear they'll use racial division as a strategy to win. Um, Democrats can hardly afford to ignore the ravages of racism and the, the signs of a deepening racial divide. How can Democrats take on race in a way that not only unites, but also succeeds at the ballot box? 
Yeah, I think it has to be both and. I, I think uh, Democrats cannot duck race, but if they make the election primarily about race, they, they play into the hands of Donald Trump and, and, and Steve Bannon. Now, I had a I had an episode in um, in 2017 where I was famous for 15 minutes where, uh, you know, Steve Bannon called me because uh, Bannon at that point was the chief strategist at the political strategist at the White House. And he had read a column that I had written that seemed to be partly agreeing with Trump, taking a tougher line on China. And uh, Bannon thought maybe we were soulmates. So he called me and neglected to put the conversation off the record. And I said, OK, uh, I get that we may agree in some respects on China, but why do you have to use appeals to white nationalism in order to get tough with China? And Bannon said, hey, I want the Democrats talking about race every day, because if the Democrats lead with race and we lead with nationalism, uh, we can beat the Democrats. And I think that's the risk. So Democrats have to uh, talk about the fact that um, white white voters and black voters are both being hurt by the economy, that white voters and black voters have a great deal in common, that uh, some of the economic uh, predations, uh, particularly the subprime, subprime collapse, uh, hurt blacks with special force, but they hurt ordinary working people uh, of all races. And so if you can create some unity, if you can break over splits of race, uh, then it makes it harder for uh, Trump to make the election about race. So go back to talking about your pocketbook populism. Well, exactly. Right? In other words, yeah. um, sure. And um, if you think about what unites white people and black people, you know, if you if you have a stronger trade union movement, that's good for working people. It's disproportionately good for black people. If you have a higher minimum wage, that's good for working people. But more black people are earning less than minimum wage. If you have comprehensive daycare, uh, that's good for everybody. But uh, black families are particularly disadvantaged by the absence of affordable daycare. And a lot of a lot of the people who work in daycare at, at really crummy wages happen to be African-American. And same deal with health care. Uh, working people are at risk of not having sufficient health care. Uh, black working people are even are, are even more at risk. And so that's, you know, Medicare. I, I mean, if you're if you're 64 and a half years old, uh, you're more likely to have uh, no decent health insurance if you're African-American. When you hit 65 and become Medicare eligible, everybody basically gets treated alike. So this is this is how you build commonality. It's how you build transracial coalition. It's how you remind black voters and white voters that uh, that the bad guy is not each other, that the bad guy uh, are the people at the very, very top, enabled by Donald Trump and the Republicans, who are making off with far too much of the pie. The name of the book, The Stakes, 2020 and the Survival of American Democracy. Bob Kuttner joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Bob, thank you so much for your time. We do look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. You're Bye-bye. quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs> We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, what we need to know about Trump's money. Bill Press talks with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist David Farenthold of The Washington Post. David, it's good to see you. Thank you. Good to be here. So, um, I looked at your website, I looked you up in Google, and it says that you are here at The Washington Post and that your, your beat is the Trump Organization. Okay, yes, right. I'm a member of the White House Correspondents Association. My beat is the Trump presidency. 
Is there any difference between <laughs> the Trump presidency and the Trump organization, and how can you tell? Well, yes, there is a difference, but the, the difference is getting smaller every day. Uh, so we, we've spent the last couple of years trying to write about this business, this sort of unusual uh, real estate hotel business that Trump owns and how it's interacting with the presidency. And for a long time, the main way it was interacting was that Trump was hurting his own brand. Uh, you know, he was driving away customers that used to fill his hotels and, and causing revenue to go down. Lately, uh, he seems to have been helping the brand by uh, visiting, becoming his own best customer and by having his, his officials go and stay at his hotels. Um, so that's been a, a change in the beat that the Trump administration and uh, its you know, top officials are some of his best customers. So the, the two are getting closer together. Is his mission uh, as president to uh, promote his own brand <laughs> and line his own pockets? I think I wouldn't say that is his only mission, uh, but certainly he has used the presidency to benefit his brand at every turn. He's visited Mar-a-Lago, he's visited Bedminster, he's, talk, he's visited uh, two overseas golf courses, he's talked about his properties all the time. Um, he's talked about holding the G7 at his property mm -hmm. in uh, Doral property outside Miami. So, um, you know, when he started, when he won the presidency, one of the basic promises he made was, I will be totally separate from my business. I'm going to own it, but I'm not going to interfere with it. I'm not, you know, I, my only thought is the American people. Um, and we've seen that promise basically wither away uh, to where now he talks about his properties all the time and seems willing to use the presidency to promote them. Well, it got off to a false start, correct? Because he did not divest, as other presidents have done, or president-elects, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, and he did not put his businesses in blind trust. He just said he was going to keep an arm's length away from them. And, That's right. And his sons would run them. Um, he did. He's not done that. Well, he or he didn't do what others have done. He didn't do what others have done, and he continues to own his businesses. Um, the, what he said about how he would not run them day to day, and he would hand over business, you know, leadership to his sons. Uh, you know, I think day to day, yes, Eric Trump is the one running the Trump organization. But what I don't know is how often Donald Trump uh, has any input in what happens with the Trump organization. You know, what kind of businesses decisions he's consulted on, if any. Um, the, I don't have a great deal of confidence that, that there's no contact there, but I don't know what the contact is. So in 2000, one of the first times that he contemplated running for president, Donald Trump told Fortune magazine, quote, it's very possible that I could be the first presidential candidate to run and make money on it. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't seen any evidence that he's made money off the presidency. Certainly campaigning is very good for the Trump business because he's used the Trump campaign to put money into a variety of his businesses. He rents office space from himself at Trump Tower, even though he has a campaign headquarters in Virginia. He um, you know, has used his businesses for a number of staging grounds for a number of his very expensive campaign events. So he's taken campaign money and put that into his property. So campaigning certainly has been a good moneymaker for Trump. Uh, the, using the presidency to put money in his pocket. He was sort of reticent about that in the first couple of years of his presidency, but has become more aggressive about it in the last couple of years. Still, though, Trump the campaigner has been much more lucrative than Trump the president. But every time the president, as president, that he stays, you name it, Mar-a-Lago. Bedminster, right. Bedminster goes to the Trump Hotel. Mm -hmm. um, there's money that goes to those properties. That's right. Some of that money yes or no, goes into Trump's pocket. Of course. Yeah, the, 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 the businesses are owned by him. Their money is his money. He can take money out of them whenever he wants. So uh, money that goes into the Trump Hotel in D.C., to the degree that there's money left over after expenses are paid, mm -hmm. that is Donald Trump's personal money. Uh, so we don't know how much money goes from the federal government to the Trump properties at, at a lot of, for a lot of these visits where he visits his own property, just because it's really hard to get records about those visits. Um, what we do know is that there, you know, there, there certainly is tens of thousands of dollars uh, that have gone to Trump's own pockets from people staying with him that accompany him to his resorts. So um, before we got together, I uh, also Googled um, Trump lining his own pockets. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to read you a couple of headlines that, that, that come up uh, just off the front mm -hmm. page. Atlant from the Atlantic, quote, the perfectly normal ways Trump can enrich himself. HuffPost, there is, there is a Trump doctrine, and it's mostly about enriching himself. <laughs> USA Today, Trump is using taxpayers to enrich himself and his family. Washington Post, welcome to the Trump kleptocracy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is he and how? 
Well, enriching himself. Well, he certainly is bringing revenue to his businesses. You know, whether that you know results in a profit, whether that's more money than he would, would have made otherwise, whether it equals the business that he's driven away by being Donald Trump the politician. I don't know. I don't know what the overall profit and loss of the Trump organization is, um, but certainly he has shown a willingness to do what no president in modern history, really, I think, in any part of U.S. history, has done, which is use the presidency in ways that put money in his own pocket, even if that's not the point of his presidency. He does it. He visits his own properties often, bringing aides in tow. He takes side trips off of international trips to his own properties. So he's putting money in his own pocket, taxpayer money into his own pocket, uh, in a way that no president in, in recent history has. Right. So uh, I want to back up a second because your reporting on this started um, even before he was sworn in, uh, for which you be reporting for which you won a Pulitzer Prize. Congratulations Thank again. You. <laughs> and it started with. Um, pledges that the Trump Foundation had made, correct? That's right. It, it started at a, a campaign rally for Trump in Iowa in February 2016, where I saw him in the middle of a campaign rally, stop the rally and say, well, hold on, um, you know, it called a local veterans group up to the stage in Waterloo, Iowa. And he says, I'm going to give you this big check from the Trump Foundation, the Donald J. Trump Foundation, big golf tournament size check for $100,000. He gives it to this group and they say, oh, you know, thank you very much, Mr. Trump. You're going to be a great president. They sit down and the rally starts again. Now, you don't see that very often. I had no. never seen that happen in a political rally. And the reason is because it's illegal to mix a uh, nonprofit uh, with a ch- presidential campaign. It's, the law specifically prohibits that. That's why people don't do it. Um, and so that got me interested in what is the Donald J. Trump Foundation? You know, where does its money come from? Why does he have all this money? Um, and it, in that case, it turned out that he had money because he'd gotten other people to put money in the Trump Foundation. It turned out to be kind of the M.O. of the Trump Foundation, uh, that he had gotten other people to donate money for veterans to his foundation. Now, he was giving it away from, you know, on stage with his name attached. So it seemed right. like a donation from him. And that got me interested in, you know, what is this foundation? How does it work? Where does its money come from? And that became a series of stories that lasted for basically all of 2016. And um, so did he give that money to the – actually give that money to the <laughs> Veterans Organization? Well, it took a while and it took some coverage of him to, to before he did it. Um, the One sort of telling episode was out of this – he said he'd raised $6 million for veterans – and, and of that, $1 million was going to come out of his own pocket. It was his own money. Um, and so we couldn't figure out. We spent all this time trying to basically prove him right, to prove that he had given away the money that he said he gave away. And I couldn't find any evidence that he had. I looked all over and couldn't find any evidence that he'd given this money away. So finally, Corey Lewandowski, uh, it was back in the news now, <laughs> yeah. um, called me. He was Trump's campaign manager then. And he said, well, I can tell you, Mr. Trump has given away all million dollars to veterans groups, but I can't tell you when he gave it away or in what amounts or when, anything else. It's all or secret. Or to what organization? Yeah, can't tell you who got it. It's all secret. And obviously, you can't take that. You know, that's not the end of the story, right? It doesn't matter who's saying that, right? It, any kind of politician says, I gave away a million dollars to extremely worthy causes, but I won't tell you what they are. Leave me alone. It's all a secret. You can't let that be the end of the story. So we spent a lot of time searching for evidence that Trump had given away that million bucks, looking for anybody who'd gotten even a dollar of it and couldn't find it. And the reason was because it, Trump hadn't given it away. What Lewandowski had said was completely untrue. Trump called us back a couple days later and said, okay, fine, now I gave the money away. Um, to, and he gave it sort of all in one fell swoop to a charity run by a friend of his. Um, after that, we thought, okay, well, if, you know, this guy under the brightest spotlight we have in American journalism, which is the coverage of a major party's presidential nominee, was apparently tried to get out of giving a donation to veterans, the most honored group in our society. You know, tried to say he'd done it when he really hadn't done it. So what was he doing before? You know, how was mm-hmm. he using his charity before right now when the spotlight was not as bright? That was kind of the jumping off point for what we looked for. And you found that he was using his uh, foundation, his charity, in some pretty creative ways. Uh. <laughs> yes, creative is a good word for it. <laughs> Basically, he, uh, he treated it, and I should say that at the start, even if this may sound obvious, but some people don't know it, even if your name is on the foundation, right, even if it's the Bill Press Foundation or the David A. Farenthold Foundation, it's still a charity, and a charity is a separate legal entity. The reason why it's tax-exempt is because the money you put in there is the charity's money. It's not your money anymore, even mm-hmm. if the charity has your name on it. 
And so you can't just spend it for whatever you want. You have to use the money, money in the charity for charitable purposes. So Trump had the Donald J. Trump Foundation, but he treated it basically as if it were another, another pocket of his wallet. He used it to buy things that benefited him. He used it to buy portraits of himself that he hung up on the wall of his golf club. Um, expensive, large, expensive portraits of himself. He used it to settle business, legal debts that his businesses incurred. Um, he used it for all kinds of things that charity money was not supposed to be used for. What happened to the foundation? Uh, in 2018, it was sued by the New York Attorney General for what the AG called persistently illegal conduct. Uh, That case is still ongoing, but the charity has been effectively shut down. Right. So you are still on a daily basis uh, looking into the Trump Organization, correct? That's right. Uh, In doing so, why do you ask people to break the law? (laughs) (laughs) So I I should explain. (laughs) Yes, go ahead. David Farnold has been accused by Eric Trump of asking employees of the Trump Organization to break the law. Take it from there. So Eric uh, was responding to something that I'd sent out to. I've sent out to a number of members of his company. One of the things you do if you're a reporter and you're, you know, covering the Trump Organization or you cover the Democratic National Committee, you cover the Washington Redskins. You need sources within the organizations you cover, and that means reaching out to a lot of people who know the things you want to know, but you don't know them. Um, and so what I was doing in this case was typical of that kind of reporting. Um, it just happened to be on the Trump Organization in this case, where I sent out emails to all these, you know, lots and lots and lots of members of the Trump Organization, employees, ex-employees, saying, here I am, basically. I cover the Trump Organization. I want to know about this company. You know it better than I do. If you want to call me, here's how to reach me. If you have documents you want to send me, here's how to, here's how to send them to me. Um, you know, so it's basically kind of an open-ended contact. I want these people to know where I am. If there's ever anything I think they think I ought to know, good or bad, here's where I am. Eric, um, you didn't threaten them. No, I mean, with what? What could I threaten them with? You didn't promise them a big check if they gave you information. I can't do that. No, no. I mean, I I've seen a copy of the email. You yes, know, this is me. If you have anything you want to talk about, here's my contact information. So, yeah, then I want people to think they can send me good things, bad things, you know, whatever they think in there that they see in their life as a Trump Organization employee that's newsworthy, the public ought to know about. Here I am. Um, I, you know, so Eric says, well, you know, this is breaking the law. And I, I guess because he thinks that I'm encouraging people to steal documents that they are not, you know, legally they're not they're not supposed to give out. I'm not asking anything like that. I just want people to know, who, here I am. If you think you have something of any kind that I ought to see, reach out to me. Right. Um, let's talk about now coming forward today because there have been some – you mentioned uh, we know the president regularly visits his, his property. Yes. You may have a more up-to-date number. Well, the most recent I saw NBC News reported at the end of April, so already two or three months ago, that out of 963 days of his presidency to that point, he had spent 297 days at his properties. That sounds right. So it's close to the, the, the count we're keeping. I mean, he goes there often on weekends. He goes there for he goes to Bedminster for a week or two in the summer. He goes to Mar-a-Lago for week you know on weekends. If he goes to Mar-a-Lago, mm-hmm. what's it cost taxpayers? Well. From what we know, which is, I think, not up to date, the, 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 because it takes so long to get information about this sort of thing out of the government, each one of those trips, the ones we've looked at have been from early 2017, uh, tens of thousands of dollars. To you, to, to, and that's just what, it, what taxpayers pay Trump. Um, in terms of what does it cost taxpayers to pay for everything else, the security, the overtime. I've seen a million dollars yeah, estimate. Is hun- that out hundreds of-, of... No, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, you think about all the different... Boats and police officers and Secret Service agents and golf cart rentals and everything else it takes to protect a big open ended place like Mar a Lago or Bedminster. Now, we should say presidents always, you know, have the right to go off and, you know, find seclusion. You know, the other right. presidents have gone to Camp David or Bush went to his ranch in Crawford. What's different about Trump is two things. One, uh, the degree to which he goes to places that benefit him, where there's a commercial interest in advertising that the president will be at this place. He could, you know, he's selling memberships to all of these places um, and selling Sterling, tickets. Sterling, Bedminster, yeah. Mar-a-Lago, yeah, all those places Durrell. are places where you can buy memberships or you can, you know, pay to come stay in a room. Um, and so he's advertising, he's using the presidency to, to sort of advertise a place that brings him revenue. It's not just his home, it's a business. Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is the, you know, the, the degree to which Trump chooses places that are, because 
that's where his clubs are located, in the middle of very difficult to police areas, right? He's not going to a ranch in the middle of it, nowhere in Texas. He's mm-hmm. not going to Camp David. He's going to places that are difficult to protect because they weren't designed to be secluded retreats. They were designed to be clubs. Um, so that raises the cost of all these things. And again, to the extent that there are staff or security who have to stay in, not at a nearby hotel, but in that property, those rooms are not free. No, the taxpayers pay for those rooms. Taxpayers pay for those rooms. And again, part of that revenue Mm -hmm. uh, goes to the president. Um, I just came from downtown Washington and right across the street, I happen to be from the Trump International Hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know of any... Mm, I'm, one night I know he went to a dinner at a private home, which was a fundraiser. I'm not sure he's ever gone out to dinner anywhere but the Trump Hotel. Not in if DC, he goes no. out in Washington, that's where he goes. That's right. Right. Um, how, how much does he make on the Trump Hotel? And we, we know also, because it's his hotel, um, people go there for a reason. Right. And you can be guaranteed, you know, well, not guaranteed, but, you, you know, it's, it raises your chances of running into him or one of his officials. There's a lot of, a lot of you know, Vice President Pence, A.G. Barr. A lot of these folks have been seen there. R- raises the chances you're going to run into somebody connected to him if you're trying to lobby one of those folks. Um, and it raises the chances that Trump himself will appear if you book a, uh, you know, you book a place at, at you book a ballroom. Um, so the revenue of that hotel is about $52 million a year. I don't know what the profit is because we only see the revenue, not the cost. Um, but certainly that's a place that brings in a lot of money to him and where, you know, him going and his officials going potentially raises its attractiveness as a venue. Bill Press talking with David Farenthold of The Washington Post. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressShow.com. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible, Robert Kuttner and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.